God's peace be with you this morning. Yeah, we're going to do things a little bit differently today, but I do want to start with just sharing this, uh, those few verses that Pastor Schley read earlier, um, an important passage in Scripture from Luke chapter 4, as Christ comes, the fulfillment of the year of Jubilee. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Jesus, unrolling and found the place where it's written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the, the full, that year of Jubilee. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and Jesus began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It was that day, and it is this day again, as Christ is in the midst of his people See, the, the year of Jubilee, we have this little tradition at uh, uh, Messiah, we call our Stewardship Sunday Jubilee Sunday. Based on that Old Testament story, the year of Jubilee was like this huge reset button. Everything was supposed to go back to square one. God knew that we, we in this sinful world and sinful reality as sinful human beings, that we would work and work and toil and that because of our sinful nature, things would get complicated and confused and we would go to bed at night clinging tightly to the things of this world. And he knew that uh, at least once a week we needed to come together and rest to connect to the God who created us and redeemed us, that our hearts and our souls needed that life-giving presence of the God who created us. That was always God's desire, that his people would gather together and that he would dwell in the midst of them and that in him we would find rest for our souls. That was always God's plan and it is still his plan today. That big reset button where we would find new life in Christ and what we need to go back into this world. Everything needed that. Even the land needed that rest to reset itself. Even your computer needs that from time to time. You have to shut it off, right, and reboot it so it kind of realigns and and has a chance to straighten itself out again. That's what happens When mankind, people come into the presence of the God who created them and redeemed them, we see things again from God's perspective. We connect to him so that our hearts and souls are rested in him. That's always the way it was from the beginning of time, that God would ask his people to come together, to give their offerings and gifts, to build him a house so that he could dwell in the midst of his people, so they could gather together and find rest in Christ. There's a picture of uh, the tabernacle in the Old Testament. That was the plan. God said, build me a house, and then you set up your community around me, and you can gather together and with me dwelling amid, amongst you in the midst of you. And that's what this passage uh, said to Moses. Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering, have them make a sanctuary, a tabernacle for me, and I will dwell among them. Solomon, King David and King Solomon knew that when they got to the promised land. They built a temple, a house for God to dwell in the midst of their nation so the people could come together and they could rest in the presence of God. Solomon said that too. The Lord has said he would dwell in a cloud. I've built a magnificent temple for a place for you to dwell forever. And that's still what happens today in the church. God tells his people to come together to gather to bring our offerings and to build him a house. And then he makes this wonderful promise, wherever two or three are gathered together my name, there I am with them. Come and find rest in me. That's the way God's kingdoms works. It's the way the church works. It's the way God designed it to be, is that God's people would gather together and he would be there in the midst of them. And I know We have this thing in the church, we gather offerings, and at face value, it looks like it goes to build buildings and to pay for utilities and staffing and work and copy machines and paper and and upkeep and custodians, and it does. But when all those things are aligned, 
for the singular purpose of gathering God's people together week in and week out around the presence of Jesus Christ, his word and his sacraments and his presence, and people come into the presence of Jesus, amazing things happen. Story after story after story of people touched by the presence of Christ. That is the outcome of our investment in the church, in the kingdom of God. As a pastor, I have the joy of seeing up close, day in and day out, those stories of what really happens because God's people invest in this place and gather together around Christ. And when people come into his presence, they are changed. We hear story after story of people who had no idea who Jesus was, living their life apart from him until they came into his presence and found what it was like to live in relationship with the God who created him and find rest for their souls. People whose lives had come off the rails and gone in a completely wrong direction, had hit rock bottom and come to God's house and find the life of Christ. People who are contemplating going off the rails, who come to the presence of Christ and go, what am I thinking? What on earth is going on? Why would I ever do that? People who have been far from Christ and come here and find him again. It happens time after time. I wish you could hear all those stories. The problem with it is, Pastor Schley and I can't tell you all those stories because they're your stories and they're often very confidential and very private And it's a very difficult thing for people to come up here and and tell you where they have been and what they have done and how Christ has worked in their life to bring them back to God again. This morning, uh, we were able to talk a couple people into doing that. I'm really glad. I'm really grateful that they were willing to do that because I I think it'll be a great blessing to to all of us. Um, The first person that I'm going to ask to come up here is uh, a young lady. Her name is Mariah Green. And uh, she's an eighth grade student. Um, This year, about 50 eighth graders are going through confirmation ministry, and they choose a life verse. And uh, they use that life verse to help share their story of faith, of, of what Jesus has done in their heart and life, and how he continues to guide them in their life of faith. It's a really powerful night, uh, it's a great experience. Every kid comes up here and with their classmates and their parents and family in the room, just talk about um, their life verse and what Christ has meant to them. And I asked Pastor Schley this year, could you tell me one that, I know you, you, they're all really good, I, I'm not asking for the best one, I'm just asking for one that uh, you think would be uh, a blessing to our people. And uh, Chuck said, yeah, let me uh, do that. And he said, hey, Mariah Green." 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. And so uh, I'm going to ask her to come up here now and uh, put this microphone there and let her share with you her life verse and her story. Hi, my name is Mariah Green, and my life verse is 1 Samuel 16, 7, which is the Lord does not look at things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. My mom was exposed to her fire when she was pregnant with me. About 67% of the babies were exposed to this virus before they died, before they were born. Of one of the, of the ones that make it her death, some are blind, some have physical disability, and some have learning disabilities. And most have a combination of these. My mom and dad found out that I had been exposed to this virus five months before I was born. And my mom prayed for me every day. I was born in Las Vegas, Nevada, with progress here in Los. I got my first hearing aid when I was six weeks old. But it didn't help much. By the time I was two years old, my hearing loss was severe. I learned to say a few words before it got worse, but then lost them. One day, my audiologist told my mom about this thing called a cochlear implant. It's kind of like a duper, super duper hearing aid that can help some people with severe to profound hearing loss, but hear better. My mom started researching and praying about this possibility for me. God guided my mom in her research 
and led her to to take our our family on a three and a half trip across the country to visit several different sign language and oral schools. She prayed that God would allow her and my dad to see clearly God's will. As we visited the different school, and he did, after visiting eight of nine schools on the schedule. My mom and dad both knew that Mook Center for the Oral Deaf Education in St. Louis was the best place for me. The next step was to determine if I was candidate for the cochlear implant. And if so, began with the long progress of testing, traveling, and injury um, hearing or surgery. We made many trips from Las Vegas to Children's Hospital in St. Louis that year. I was two years old by the time. During one of those trips, we stopped at in southern Missouri at a Cracker Barrel to eat dinner. But I wasn't feeling well from the medicine they had given me at the hospital. I was crying and didn't want to eat, so my mom walked me around the store while my mom, my dad and sister ate. A woman spoke to my mom and asked if I was okay. My mom told her why I was crying, and the woman said she was on her way to Oklahoma City, and she would be praying for me the whole way home. Wow, she didn't know me, but she was going to pray for me. How awesome! Months later, we were back in St. Louis again for my big surgery. This was our fourth trip in three months. My surgery went well, but we had to stay in the hotel in St. Louis for another, another seven days after I was released from the hospital so my doctor could make sure I was healing properly. I had white bandages that were covering most of my head. The only parts that weren't bandaged were my, my eyes, nose, and mouth. One day while we were at breakfast in the hotel, there was a man that asked my mom what happened to me. Everyone stopped to listen. She told my story and he said that he would be praying for me. As he and his wife were leaving at the breakfast area, his wife told my mom that she would be praying for me too. Can you believe it? All these people were praying for me, and they didn't even know me. We moved to St. Louis the following month, and I officially started school at Mook Center. I was three years old and didn't have any spoken language. But look at me now. I can talk. I'm mainstream and go to Fort Small South Middle School. I like to act, and I'm a competitive cheerleader. I am thankful for all the people that pray for me, and I am confident that God has been and continues to be with me every day in my life. I am so thankful for, to God for my parents who do so much for me. I am thankful that they bring me to church every, each week. I am thankful for the confirmation class, and I am thankful for the future. It is comforting to know that God doesn't care what I look on the outside, how smart I am, or how good I am at chillity. I know that he only cares about what's in my heart. I am happy that through baptism, I am God's child, and I look forward to conforming my faith in just a few months. I am blessed that to be God's family and grow up that in that family through Messiah and Lutheran Church. Thank you, and may God bless you too. All right. Let's stand right here for a second. Hey, thanks for doing that. That was a pretty brave thing to do. And... Uh, a real encouragement for a lot of people, too. What a wonderful witness of faith that is and uh, how the Lord has blessed you and answered a lot of your prayers. And uh, we're glad that uh, we can be a part of that Messiah. I'm just going to say a word of prayer real quick, all right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we're just so grateful for Mariah and um, the way that your Holy Spirit has worked in her heart. 
that uh, even though she has walked through some tremendous challenges in her young life, um, that she has known the joy of walking through those challenges with Jesus, Um, that you've surrounded her with parents and family and friends who care very deeply for her, that you've given her that blessing to walk through those challenges with her, and that you've also given her the church and a lot of wonderful Christian people who didn't even know her, but in kindness and love have prayed for her fervently. Uh, We thank you for uh, being a part of Mariah's life, and we know, Lord, that you will continue to be a shining light in her heart as she lives out her faith for you. Continue to bless her, Lord, and use her for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks so much, Mariah. Uh, Wonderful, wonderful story. Um, The second story I'd like to share with you today is uh, a member of our church, Andy Engel, and I'm going to ask Andy to come on up here and have a seat next to me. Uh, Andy has been a member of our church for a few years, and I had the joy a few years ago of getting to know Andy a little bit and uh, have quite a few conversations with him uh, uh, through the process of um, really kind of uh, understanding the gospel and what the church and what the kingdom of God and uh, Jesus were about, and so and to hear his story uh, personally, and uh, was also able to uh, twist his arm and convince him to uh, share that story with you this morning. So. Andy, mind introducing yourself quickly to uh, people of Messiah? Sure. <clears throat> so before we start, I should probably let you know I'm using Pastor Chuck's microphone. Yes. So I'm Excellent. a little nervous because I know I'm going out over WGN and all of Chicago land <laughs> right now. So, yeah. um, so, hey, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andy Engel. I'm uh, one of the elders or one of the Aquamen here at Messiah. Uh, my wife, Melissa, and my son, Joshua, and I have been here since about 05. All right. And what do you do um, to pay the bills? I am a field engineer for Microsoft in my 16th year. Yes, he is a total computer nerd. I mean, down <laughs> through and through. Is you that know? a theological term? Yeah, okay. it is, actually it. is. So, all right, Andy, tell them, let's start out. Just tell them a little bit about what it, you were like as a kid growing up in terms of uh, church, faith, um, relationship with Jesus Christ. What was your childhood like? Well, it's easy because it's all just childhood. Uh, it's the, the, the rest, despite what I thought at the time, uh, were really uh, areas of emptiness for me. God still had a lot of work to do with me. Um, growing up, my parents had strong faith, but it wasn't something that they, they regularly shared with us. Um, who knows why? But uh, I would have considered myself a Christian anyway. Uh, we didn't go to church. We didn't go to Sunday school and all that. But if anybody had ever asked me, hey, are you a Christian? I would have said, of course. I you know, salute the red, white, and blue. I love mom and apple pie, and I'm a Christian because that's what you're supposed to be in our culture. Uh, so, so I would have said that. But, but you, so you, you didn't go to church, really, ever? No. And you didn't go to Sunday school, vacation Bible school? You didn't hear Bible stories in the house? You no. didn't have, uh, you didn't pray? You weren't taught to pray? No. Um, your knowledge of Jesus Christ, of the Scriptures, was, I mean... The net is probably the Lord's Prayer that that someone had taped to my mirror as a kid, but other than that, uh, no, not a lot of of education. And yet, growing up, if somebody would have asked you, you would have said, yes, I'm a Christian. Absolutely. Um, I would have said that. Which is probably indicative a little bit of our American culture, that uh, for us and many generations growing up in in America, it was the right thing to say is, I'm a Christian. To say you weren't was almost like a a black eye. And maybe that's changing a little bit today, but... um, an interesting situation. Okay, and then part of your child is you saw this, that yep. crucifix. Yep. So as a kid, uh, my parents, uh, we, we spent a lot of time at a tavern, which isn't as bad as it quite sounds. Uh, in the small village of Brussels, Illinois, just a few miles north of here, it really was the social hub or the social uh, center of the community. Well, a kid can only spend so long there. Um, they did have video games, and mom would give me quarters, but, you know, once you're awesome at Space Invaders, you're done, right? So you go wander around, you find other kids to play with. Well, one of the things I came across was right across the street uh, from this place, and I saw this, and as I was telling my dad I was going to be sharing the story, he said, you know, you actually came in one time and said, there's a guy hanging on a tree over there, what's that all about? Um, But at one point, you know, I I would spend a lot of time just contemplating, what is this, asking myself in my heart, and now I realize that's the Holy Spirit reaching out to me and saying, hey, um, I'm waiting for you, I'm bringing you to to Christ. Um, I did, uh, on occasion, leave a few of my quarters there, maybe my first Jubilee offering, or maybe I was just funding some other kid's Space Invaders habit, I don't know. But uh, ultimately, that was kind of the first revelation I had, that there's something bigger than us at play here. And then, 
kind of uh, through high school then, you did have an experience, though, that kind of exposed you specifically to the message of yep. who Jesus was. Yep. Well, God works through his people. And at one point, my brother Rodney and his wife Lisa had a little girl, and they said, Andy, you didn't uh, embarrass us at our wedding when you were the best man, so we'd like you to be the godfather for our daughter. Uh, Pastor McKelvey here, this is St. Matthew Lutheran Church in that same village. Uh, the keystone over the door says 1891, which uh, I think is pretty cool. Um, but they said, before you can do that, you have to be baptized. And nobody, because of the, the background that we had, nobody really knew if I had been baptized or, or they weren't sure. So he said, well, we're going to baptize you. But before we do that, we're going to talk about what baptism means. And that really struck a note with me from the, from the perspective of this gospel message, uh, the fact that, that there is a Christ, a Messiah, uh, who died for me to, to, to save me from my sins. So uh, in June of 1990, my goddaughter Jamie and I were baptized. Go ahead, let's look at the next picture. Uh, inside of that church, at that font you see in the bottom center, so it's, uh, you can tell that the, they don't worship quite like we do here at Messiah, but uh, they, they are Lutheran brethren uh, in the same, same fold, so... Ah. That's, that's where it all began. Looking back, I bet you're grateful that there were a people of God in that community who built the house for the Lord and that through a series of events, for whatever reason, it's, it's their, phenomenal. their pastor you, was there to tell you. Yeah, you, you can't count the number of small things that people did and probably didn't think it mattered that led to, to that moment. Yeah, I know sometimes uh, for people who have grown up in a church and that's familiar turf to them, you don't right. always hear what it's like for somebody who's never even stepped foot in there yep. and uh, how impacting it can be when they first hear that message. There is something, even just the power of that, yeah. walking by that and going, there's something there. Yeah. I, I may not know it, but the reality of, of Jesus hanging on a cross um, stirs. <laughs> well, it's something it about the, 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 the stark nature of it. You know, as a kid, even you look at it and you say, this isn't normal. This is something significant. All right, so um, you were baptized, and then, what, you became a missionary, sold everything you had, and... Uh, what, no, well, that right? was a secret. You, you weren't <laughs> supposed to share that part. No. So, no, I was 17, you know, and after spending a, a, a wonderful month meeting with Pastor McKelvey, because that's what every 17-year-old boy wants to do, um, I was baptized and immediately headed back to being a self-centered 17-year-old. Um, I finished, uh, or left high school, um, went to college did all the wonderful and colorful things that a young man in college tends to do, which led to a self-imposed enlistment in the Army. I said, you know, I've got to get myself straightened out. So uh, I signed up for that. A little more, stronger dose of the law. Nothing but, yeah. really. And so uh, even in the military, <laughs> you, an, a door was open? Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, you know, um, uh, you know, the Army isn't a monastery. So it's not a great spiritual formation place normally. I've heard that. Yeah. But in this case, at Fort Knox, Kentucky, on Sunday mornings, the drill sergeants gave us two options. Clean the barracks, including buffing the floors and all the tops of the light fixtures and dirt in places that you didn't know dirt could go, or go to church. Which one do you think I picked? Well, I was at the 8 o'clock service, so I, you, went to, <laughs> you went to church. Spoiler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, I took, you know, believe it or not, there were a lot of guys that stayed in the barracks. They would rather stay in the barracks than go to, go to church, but that's probably a topic for another day. Um, so we went, and, and we went to that, and then immediately following the service, there was the opportunity to eat candy bars and also avoid the drill sergeants, which they also called pre-marriage counseling. I wasn't engaged, but I didn't care. It gave me another hour outside of uh, the, the watchful eye of the drill sergeants, so, so that's what we did. But again, that was another place where the Spirit continued to work, uh, continued to... to remind me of, of what was going on and that this is something to pay attention to. So another step down that path. All right. So then you uh, enter into the work world and family life. Yeah, I was all grown up then, I thought. So, uh, uh, you know, went back to college, finished that, uh, started with Microsoft and immediately began doing everything I could do to make myself the king, um, seeking all of the material and status and possessions and everything else that, that people can get trapped up in, and ultimately that led to a place of great enlightenment that I call anxiety and frustration, uh, realizing that you can't have it all and there's always more. So, um, It was about that point that, uh, that God blessed me with Melissa, who I married in 1997, and then a few years later, uh, he said, all right, you've got this mastered, 
you think you're good, here's a baby. So uh, he gave us Joshua in 2003. And that's when the light bulb went on. Started to tell me that this isn't all about me. That it's an opportunity to say, all right, what can you do for the kingdom versus what can the kingdom do for you? That's amazing sometimes the way God created life, that uh, marriage, having children, is a powerful way for God to kind of yep. slap you upside the head a little bit. And, yep. um, he, uh, we all have that story. So, and so that, that happened. That kind of led you to, hey, maybe we should go to church. Yeah, young couples do a lot of that. You know, we kind of shop the whole church thing. I, I should tell you we were married in an ELCA congregation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we need to fix Take care of that later. Yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to bring that out in front of everybody, but <clears throat> facts are facts. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we visited a lot of churches, uh, some of the mega churches, and really one of the things that we found is a lot of churches out there either hit you in the heart, which means they make you feel great. You walk out and you're like, oh, I'm going to go do wonderful things for the Lord today, like go to Waffle House. Um, or they hit you in the head and you, and you learn a lot, but you don't often get the combination uh, of both in, in one place. So that's kind of what led us to Messiah. Uh, is the fact that we worship in a gym, which is wonderfully practical and does things for the kingdom, but uh, also that our theology was solid and we had a good time. Right, and so that, that was kind of a process for you of starting to connect the dots, seeing what the faith was really about, seeing what Christ was about, yeah. Christian life. Yep. How'd that kind of come together for you? Well, it all starts with Captain Advent. Yeah. <laughs> yes, many people's yeah. story. Yeah. Captain Advent. No, it's, uh, honestly, it's one of my, my earliest memories of Messiah is the Captain Advent experience. But what, what hit home for me was that there was still a purpose for that. It wasn't just funny, and it wasn't just fun, but it was funny and fun for a reason. It, it was to communicate the, the, the gospel message. And that's really kind of what hooked us. And then we, we developed and we became members of a, a small group for parents. Uh, we've met many wonderful people at Messiah, and now... Eight or nine years later, we, we couldn't think of another place as home. So, so where are you at now with it? What's, where is it? Well, if you, if you look back, it was all about nobody's king, and then it was I'm going to make myself the king. And then actually there was a period in there where I said I'm going to master this Jesus thing. I'm going to know it all so that I can be absolutely certain of my salvation and, and tell everybody else how much better than them I am. I was kind of asking Jesus to make me the king. And kind of where I've landed now is realizing that I'm making him the king. That, that we need to, to make the effort to, to put him at the forefront of our life, and that you never reach that point where you say, I'm done, I've got it. I'm totally solid in this faith thing, and I never have to think about it again. Um, because as a very wise theologian once told me, that if you're in the mud and you're considering it, your heart's in the right place because you're putting the effort into it, into, into loving Christ and seeking him. You know who that guy was? C.S. Lewis. No, close. C.S. Schley. C.S. Schley. Different guy. Charles. Different guy completely. Yeah. But oh, this all led me to my life verse, uh, which is Matthew 6.33, ironically enough. We have Messiah on the next shot. Yeah, that's, that's my current stop on my path, because this is a path, not a, not a destination, to abuse the cliche, um, is that you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I had things in the wrong order. I was putting life first. I was putting this world first, rather than Christ first. And now, with that life verse, it's, it's really working out that way. Right, Mr. Andy, thanks for sharing that with us today. Absolutely. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm just going to thank you. You can clap for him, and then I um, stay right there for a second. I'm just going to say a prayer with Andy real quick, too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your Spirit's work in Andy's life and heart and his, his willingness to uh, share his journey of faith, Lord. For all of us, it's a humbling thing because at the root of that journey is... Um, the process of discovering that it's not all about us, and that's a very humbling thing, um, that it's, it takes us a while sometimes, Lord, for that to sink in, and we wrestle with it every day. It's hard for us all to admit that. We thank you for Andy's willingness to share that, knowing that it resonates in all of our hearts. Thank you for this place called Messiah and uh, the gospel that is shared here and the ministries that take place to connect people to Jesus Christ, and we pray that you'd continue to use Andy um, to bring glory to the, the great name of Jesus Christ in his name. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Here's my last story for this morning. Um, this one I have to tell, though I don't, I don't have a firsthand account, because Austin lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He can't be here today. Um, but I met Austin uh, just a couple weeks ago in Uganda, and uh, he was on a mission team, not the team I was on, 
uh, but a different team uh, from uh, Texas and Ann Arbor. And uh, we ended up overlapping by about two days. So we had dinner together, and I was sitting next to him and just asked him how his trip had been. And uh, he started sharing this story with me about his sponsored child, whose name is Arafat. Austin um, got connected to our Uganda Mission Project through Tim Radke, who was a friend of Chuck and mine from seminary, who Chuck invited to go to Uganda. And because of um, uh, your participation and support in that mission project, Tim got connected to it. He was a vital part of his church down in Dallas of um, doing a couple things, um, raising the funds to purchase property for the seminary, which we dedicated while we were there in February, and also raising the funds to break ground, uh, the groundbreaking ceremony that took place to begin construction of facilities, which is a huge part of uh, that uh, national church body there, the Lutheran Church of Mission in Uganda. So Austin, uh, Tim had a call to Ann Arbor, Michigan, St. Luke's Lutheran Church. He went up there to visit. He did not take that call, but he met Austin and a few other people, told him about uh, the mission work going on in Uganda. They said, hey, we'd like to go. So they teamed up. So uh, even the series of events of the people of Messiah, there are connections beyond these walls that you'd never dream of, and we can't even begin to tell you all the stories of things that happen. This is just one example that's happening hundreds of times over. So Austin is, uh, works for the University of Michigan, um, who beat Indiana yesterday, but I'm telling the story anyway today. I'm just, I put that picture up there, and uh, he's a photographer for them in their marketing department. He was there to do some photojournalism, to follow a pastor, a teacher, to take pictures and tell the story of what a day in the life of somebody doing ministry in Uganda is like. Um, one of the stops that day was in the village of Bafula, which is the Hope Lutheran Church, Lubbock, Texas, that village. It's Hope Lutheran Church in Bafula. His child uh, goes to school there, Arafat. And uh, they were in the village, and it's hard to explain what that experience is like if you haven't been there, but um, usually there's a, a big crowd of kids that are there, and you're trying to hand out packets and take pictures and meet kids and play with them and have fun and, and find out who's all there, and the crowd kind of grows and grows as the, days goes, as the day goes on, and it's, a, it's a, a difficult thing to manage, it's just kind of overwhelming, but it's a very, very special thing when a sponsor is able to go there and be in the village and meet their child. I can tell you that firsthand, uh, twice I've been there and able to spend time with David, our sponsor child. It is a powerful experience to see that firsthand of the difference uh, you're making in their life um, with the doors that you're helping open for them. So he was in that village and Arafat was not there. Some of the kids uh, told him that um, he wasn't there, that he'd broken his leg. And uh, so Austin was, you know, buried and trying to help the team to get their job done. And so the kids went and told Arafat that Austin was there. And he lived just around the corner. So um, in Africa, they don't have crutches. They just use a pole. And so he hobbled over there and uh, in a lot of pain. And uh, he was there in front of Austin. And Austin could see he was in tears, that he was hurting. And he could tell by looking at his leg, it was broken. It was that evident. It was obvious. And so um, he was trying to ask questions of what found out what was going on, but he couldn't. They were kind of overwhelmed with the crowd. Austin, or Arafat kind of slipped off into the crowd, and uh, he didn't hear what happened. So he asked the Hearts and Hope staff from Uganda there to take him to Arafat's house and uh, took a translator with him and able, was able to find out what was happening. Well, the story, what had happened was six weeks earlier, six weeks earlier, Arafat had broken his leg. Both bones in the lower leg had been displaced and were not uh, in alignment and were healing over six months, as you would imagine. And so he was basically crippled. And that, that leg was not was so much pain. He was not going to be able to use it again. It was already getting smaller. And that probably would have been his life. He probably would have been crippled uh, the rest of his life. So Austin said, is there a way we can take him to the hospital? I will gladly pay for it. And he said about 10 seconds after those words came out of his mouth, he was said, I have no idea how much does this cost or if I can pay for it. <laughs> I'm going to call my wife and say, hey, uh, you got $50,000. <laughs> he just volunteered to spend. So he had no idea what he'd gotten himself into, but they took him to the hospital and uh, um, they were able to take an x-ray. I'm just going to show that to you, not for very long because it, it, it's hard to even look at that. But this kid is eight years old and they had to re-break the leg and set it and cast it. And they have to do that without anesthesia. So that little kid went through a pretty traumatic experience. On the other side of it, they came out to Austin and said, you know, he's going to be fine, and it's going to cost you $80. $80. And so that kid whose future was to be crippled the rest of his life, uh, I was glad we got snowed out last week because I got this picture on Monday. <laughs> and I can show you that uh, cast is off. 
and uh, he's got a new lease on life. And I, I know that that is a story of a, a physical healing that was able to take place, really only, only by God's grace that Austin was in that village that day. Because I, I just tell you, the numbers are so overwhelming, you just cannot help everyone. You just, you can't do it. Uh, but because he was there and able to make that connection and get that done, um, his life was blessed in that way. And on the other side of that is, I, I don't know Arafat's story. I, I don't know if he's a Christian. I don't know what his family's faith life is. But I do know that uh, because of Austin's relationship with him, he's going to Hope Lutheran School every day. Um, that Hearts and Hope organization is helping foster that. He's hearing about Christ and uh, that the support that was given to him and his family was given through the church. Um, so that is uh, in the name of Christ that this good news comes to them and their family. And uh, that is just the beginning of the stories of what happens when God's people come together, they invest in a house for God to dwell, and Christ keeps his promise to dwell among us. People's hearts are touched and changed. Uh, we give generously to the sport of the kingdom of God, and God's people do their thing. Listen, I know, I know that running to, to, to build a house for God to live in and to operate that week in and week out, it takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of resources. It always has. It always has for God to have a house among his people and for people to gather week in and week out and to have Christ-centered worship, it takes time, energy, and resources. And we know that when we're caught up in all of that organizational work, that from time to time it gets tiring. From time to time we disagree about things. From time to time there are conflicts. From time to time we hurt each other, and it's tough and it's difficult. And I know that it's a face value, that it looks like our our offerings go to, to build a building and to make repairs and to pay for utilities and to pay for health insurance and copy machines and, and lights and all those kind of things. But I hope just a glimpse today, you can see that that's God's plan of how he works in this world. That when all those things come together, and they're all aligned for God's people to gather together around the gospel and the sacraments, and Jesus is there. Amazing things happen in people's lives. There are hundreds, thousands of stories, just like the ones you heard this morning. And it's not all that difficult for you to hear some of those firsthand all you have to do is ask someone. Somebody that you're sitting right next to now or behind you that you know or don't know, take a chance to get to know someone. Find out who they are and maybe over a cup of coffee or standing around, just say, hey, what's your story? What's your story? What brings you here? How'd you get to this place? What's God doing in your life? Maybe tell them your story. You'd be astounded what happens when Jesus lives in his house among his people. People have the chance to hit that reset button week in and week out. Sins are forgiven, connected to the good news, the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ to go out and live again. It's a beautiful thing. I love this church. I love the church. I hope you do too. There's nothing better to invest your heart, your time, your energy, your life into in the kingdom of God. It really is. The local church, it is the hope of the world. It is the place people find Jesus Christ. It is the place God dwells among his people. I hope you find great joy in being a part of it. I hope the Holy Spirit gives you just a little glimpse, a little taste each day of the difference he's making as you join in his work. Let's just bow our heads and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much today for these servants of yours who have been willing to share their story. I know for every person in this room, Lord, there is a story. There is a journey of faith. 
There are people with stories that uh, their journey led them far from you, that they have pursued other things and tried to build their lives on the things of this world and have hit rock bottom and come unglued until they've uh, come into the presence of Christ. I know there are people who have journeyed close to you all their days. There are people who have come into this place and because they've heard your word, it has spared them untold pain and grief of going down the wrong path. There are people who have found forgiveness and the ability to forgive, relationships reconciled, miraculous things, Lord, when they are connected to Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to see that. Help us to invest deeply in the work of your church, sacrificially as you've asked us to do, knowing that on the other side of this ministry, you are doing amazing things, not in this church, Lord, but in every church where Jesus Christ lives and is proclaimed. Lord, continue to bless us and fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen.